This presentation is to give an overview on how to approach a patient with cervical lymph adenopathy. We will briefly go through the causes of cervical lymph adenopathy, followed by targeted history taking and physical examination. The causes of cervical lymph adenopathy can be categorized into the broad categories of autoimmune, iatrogenic, metabolic, infective, neoplastic, and idiopathic. The exact causes of each category are listed above. In general, the majority of causes include infective causes and neoplastic causes. As there are a large variety of neoplastic disorders that cause cervical lymphadenopathy, a varied history needs to be taken. This will be covered in the next section. The purpose of the history is to find the cause, followed by complications and associations of the cause. Naturally, the duration of cervical lymphadenopathy and mode of onset are noted. A lesion present for a few weeks and growing in size is more sinister than a stable lesion present for two years. The level of the neck where the cervical lymph adenopathy is located is also important. Level 1 to 4 nodes are often due to a primary in the head and neck. Level 5 nodes can be from the head and neck, chest, breast, lung, or even abdomen, such as the case of a workhouse node. When the cervical lymph adenopathy fluctuates in size, especially with infections, the node is likely reactive. Medications, such as phenytoin, may cause cervical lymph adenopathy. Also, remember to ask if the patient has been pre-treated with other medications. If there is suspicion of infection, such as tuberculosis in particular, risk factors should be asked for in detail. These include travel history to endemic countries, as well as positive contact history. The five S's, which represent the risk factors for oral cancers, should also be asked for. Five S's stand for spirits, such as alcohol consumption, smoking, sharp teeth or dentures, syphilis, and spice, which equates to betel nut chewing. Associated symptoms will be discussed in the next slide. A personal history of previous cancer or family history of cancer is also useful. In general, the systemic review is covered under the associated symptoms, but is included here for completeness. Associated symptoms help us to identify the cause and organ system involved that may result in the cervical lymph adenopathy. The head and neck drains into the cervical lymph nodes. Therefore, any infection affecting the head and neck can present with cervical lymph adenopathy. Associated symptoms to ask for include fever, headache, purulent nasal discharge, nasal obstruction, and smell disturbances, which can indicate upper respiratory tract infections, sinusitis, and adenoiditis. Neck swellings, shortness of breath, odynophagia, and dysphonia may indicate a neck abscess or cellulitis laryngitis, epiglottitis, tonsillitis, or infectious mononucleosis. Skin disorders such as carbuncles or infected eczema of the neck or scalp skin can also result in cervical lymphadenopathy. Arthralgia, alopecia, anemia, fever, joint deformities, and oral ulcers can indicate an underlying autoimmune cause such as Kawasaki disease, rheumatoid arthritis, or systemic lupus erythromatosis. Other associated lumps can be the primary lesion and are usually infective or malignant in nature. Anemia symptoms such as palpitations, tachycardia, postural hypotension or giddiness may indicate underlying hematogenous abnormalities. B symptoms like night sweats, loss of appetite, and loss of weight indicate possible lymphoma or tuberculosis. Physical examination of the neck. First, look at the patient as a whole. Look for clues that tell the cause of the cervical lymph adenopathy. 
These include pallor and cachexia, which may indicate a more chronic and sinister cause. Syndromic facies, such as red lips and conjunctivitis in a child, point to Kawasaki disease. After that, look for any neck lumps or scars over the neck, which may indicate previous surgery. Proceed to perform the neck examination after asking the patient whether they have any pain over the neck. If the lump is not obvious, you may ask the patient to show you where it is. Have the patient sit on a chair while you stand behind the patient. Palpate the nodes on one side of the neck before moving on to the other side. Do not palpate both sides at the same time, as it may make the patient feel uncomfortable. The right hand is used to palpate the right nodal level sequentially from level 1 to 6 as shown in the diagram. The left hand is used to palpate the left nodes. I find the best way to palpate is to move in a circular massaging fashion. When examining the nodes, it is important to note the following. The number of nodes, the location and levels of the nodes, which can give us a clue as to where the primary is from. The size of the nodes, which affects staging, overlying skin changes, and whether the nodes are matted or fixed. If there are other neck masses, please proceed to examine them thoroughly. Central neck lumps should be approached as per the thyroid or thyroglossosis examination, and lateral neck lumps should follow the general inspection, palpation, percussion examination. Following the neck examination, we move on to a full upper aerial digestive tract examination. This involves nasal endoscopy for a full view of the anterior and posterior nasal space, the oropharynx, hypopharynx, and larynx for any masses of infection. At the same time, we can also look for pooling of saliva, which may indicate a deeper hypopharyngeal lesion. After that, we perform a full head and neck examination consisting the oral cavity, salivary glands, thyroid, ears, scalp, and face. We do not have to follow the exact sequence of the examination from the neck to the head and neck exam. If there is an obvious tumour of the neck, such as a thyroid lump, then logically that should be examined first, prior to nasal endoscopy. If there is no obvious primary lesion to account for the cervical lymphadenopathy, or if there are multiple bilateral cervical lymph nodes, then other lymph node basins should also be inspected as lymphoma is a high possibility. The lymph node basins include the axillary, inguinal, as well as trochlear lymph nodes. The patient can also be checked for anemia, as well as hepatosplenomegaly, which will support this diagnosis. If tuberculosis is suspected, offer to auscultate the chest. If the nodes are infraclavicular, offer to perform a breast and abdominal examination. The investigations performed depend on the suspected cause. If there is an obvious cause like acute tonsillitis, then no further diagnostic laboratory investigations or imaging is necessary. Often a fine needle aspiration cytology is performed. In effective cases, a full blood count and an erythrocyte sedimentation rate can be checked. In suspected autoimmune cases, peripheral blood films, rheumatoid factor, anti-nuclear antibody, anti-double-stranded DNA antibody can also be checked. Suspected tuberculosis cases can have their TB quantiferon taken, and suspected infectious mononucleosis cases can have a monospot done. A chest X-ray would be useful for patients with respiratory symptoms, those with suspected TB, or even to look for pulmonary metastases in a head and neck malignancy. A CT neck and ultrasound neck are both useful to quantify the number of cervical lymph nodes as well as to look for a primary that could not be found on physical examination. Lastly, mantle testing can also be performed in suspected tuberculosis patients.